Hi class, Dr. Jim here. In this lecture, we're actually going to be looking at the smallest, if you can say organisms, smallest organisms that we're going to be talking about throughout the rest of the semester. And so we're going to be looking at the viruses. This is really the first lecture that you guys are going to have that are going to take us through the survey of all the different organisms that we have in biology. And the first ones we're going to look at are viruses. And so I think this is a really important uh, topic to talk about because we deal with viruses all the time. A lot of you have been sick with viruses throughout your life, maybe some more serious than other times, but typically we deal with these all the time in our lives. And again, the one remarkable thing is all the viruses that are out there, we hardly ever get sick. If you look at it in the amount, yes, you probably suffer from a cold here or there once in a while, but typically for most of our lives in that year, if you look at a year at a time, most of the time we're very healthy and there are viruses all over the place. Okay, So today we're going to kind of look at what is a virus and what makes up a virus. So let's take a look at these different things. All right, so the first thing is, is we're going to look at what is a virus. Now you probably maybe have talked about viruses before or maybe you've heard some things like Ebola and some other things like that. But today we're going to actually look at the structure and function of what a virus is. I'm then going to pose the question, do you think a virus is alive? And we're going to look at some pros and cons for that uh, and kind of get an idea of why we think or why we don't think viruses are alive. And then finally, or I guess the next thing we're going to do is look at how does it reproduce. And so we use these things and we call them life cycles. But again, it argues whether or not a virus is alive. But we talk about are they in one cycle? Do they make new viruses or are they hiding out? And so we'll look at both of those situations and talk about how a virus goes about its business. And then finally, I'm going to talk about one last new infectious particle, and that's called the prions. And prions are these new infectious particles that have come out recently in the last 20 years, although they've been around for a lot longer than that. But really, the information and work and research that's been done on them have really been done in the last 20 years. And where we see these, so think back to the late 1990s. Many of you were probably very young at the time, but I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the disease called mad cow disease. And so we'll look at that and kind of discuss what that's all about and what happens there. And so... So this will kind of give us an idea of some of these really, really tiny infectious particles and what they do. So let's take a look at all these different things. So what is a virus? Well, a virus is an infectious organic molecule, meaning that it has organic components to it. Okay, there's two parts. There's a nucleic acid core, and that nucleic acid could be DNA, like all our cells are, or it could be RNA, and actually scientists use this as a way to classify viruses. And so we have both RNA viruses and DNA viruses out there. Some of the DNA viruses that are out there that you may have heard of are basically ones that cause herpes, so herpes 1 and herpes 2, and even chickenpox, which is a herpes virus. And these are all DNA viruses, meaning that they have DNA as their genome. RNA viruses are ones that are out there that cause the things like flu, so influenza, HIV, and even that wonderful Rio virus or Noah virus that maybe give you diarrhea for a couple of days and that stuff. These are all RNA type viruses. And so there's a lot of different viruses out there and we classify them whether or not they have the DNA on the inside or RNA on the inside. The other thing that a virus, all viruses have is a protein coat. And that protein protects the DNA or RNA that's in the inside. We call that protein a capsid, kind of like a cap that you wear on your head. And so that capsid protects the virus. And so I always associate a virus like with an M&M, &M, okay? M&M &M has a nice candy crunchy shell on the outside and a yummy chocolate on the inside. We'll think of a virus kind of the same way. It has that protein coat on the outside or protein shell. And then on the inside, that chocolate is the RNA or DNA on the inside. And that's typically what we see in all viruses. Now, most viruses also include these things called spikes. If you look at this picture here that I have of the animal virus here, they have these spikes, or some of them will even have a membrane with these spikes on the outside. Now, what these spikes encode for are like these keys. So think of it, you all have a house key that allows you to get into your house, and each one of those keys are slightly different. Virus works the same way. A lot of these spikes are like keys, and what they do is they look for the right lock that are found on certain cells. That gives a virus very good specificity. So sometimes they only infect humans. So sometimes if you get a cold, you don't pass it on to your dog or cat because that virus only infects humans. And that's because they only have the right lock to bind to human cells. The other thing we look at is in the tissues themselves. A lot of viruses only affect one system. So if you think back to your, or if you're gonna take AMP and that stuff and you have multiple systems in the human, 
Again, what we think about is that viruses only tend to attack one system at a time. So like the hepatitis virus only attacks the liver because they have the key that binds to the liver cells. Or if you think of the flu virus, the flu virus only has the key that binds to the respiratory, uh, the respiratory tissue. And so you think of those spikes being like the keys that look for the specific lock. And that's what we think of viruses themselves. The other thing I want to point out is that some of these viruses have this membrane around it. Not all, and quite a few don't. And I'm going to bring this up again here in a couple minutes, what the difference is between one that does and one that doesn't. And it's another way to describe viruses, whether they have the membrane or not. Okay, so if we look at the virus structure itself, it's very, very small, anywhere from 10 to 400 nanometers in diameter, so very, very small. If we look at bacteria under the microscope, those are we're talking about in micrometers. That's 10 to the minus 6. So think back to that first week of school, and it, you know, I know it's been a while now, and you remember your ruler, you, had the, you measured in centimeters and you measured in millimeters. Well, nanometers is 10 to the minus 9. If you think about centimeters, that's 10 to the minus 2. Millimeters is 10 to the minus 3. Okay? Nanometers is actually 10 to the minus 9. It's a million times smaller than the 1 millimeter. And so think about the size. It's very, very tiny. You will not see any viruses in lab because we do not have light microscopes that can see that far, that small. And so what you will, where you will see them is in pictures using electron micrographs. And that's the key. We have these wonderful pictures done by electron microscopes that actually can see viruses. And that's how we know that they're actually there. It's not that we can see them with our light microscopes, but they are there. And they're everywhere. Okay? The two, the two shapes of viruses typically come in are two, two different varieties or two different flavors. You have what is called the icosahedral, which is a 20-sided object. So you Dungeons and Dragons players out there, I know you, you're out there. If you think about a 20-sided die, that's what we're thinking about with a virus. It's something that has 20 sides. And so some of you may have played even a complex board game that has a multiple die that has, you know, 15 or 16 sides. So kind of think of it like that. It had, but this virus has multiple sides and it has kind of this pyramid box kind of shape. It's kind of a, you know, one of these things where it has multiple sides and shapes to it. And that's typically what we see with a virus. There are some viruses out there that do form rods. There are some human viruses that do, like rabies. That, that kind of tends to look more like a bullet, so it has kind of a rounded nose cone on it. But there are a lot of rod viruses out there as well. And so I don't want to just say that they're one type or the other, but typically these are the two types that you're going to see, is the icosahedral and a rod. And if you ever see me draw it in class, like on the lecture and lecture Monday, you'll actually see me draw it mostly like this, and that's kind of how I represent a virus. Okay? I talked about the difference between having a membrane and not having a membrane. And think of it like when you go outside without a coat. When you go outside without a coat, you're naked, you don't have, you're exposed to the elements, and that's the same thing with a virus. If you don't have a membrane, you're called a naked virus, and people tend to remember that pretty well. The other one is the envelope virus. This is a virus that has a membrane around it, and so it surrounds that virus, it keeps it inside, and keeps it protected. And so what that allows it to do is actually allows it to bind to cells a little bit easier because it takes the cell or takes the membranes from the host cell. So viruses themselves don't make the membrane. They actually steal it from the host cells that they infect. And we're going to see a little bit more of this as we go throughout the lecture, but just kind of keep that in mind. And if you have a membrane, you're an envelope virus. If you don't have a membrane, you're a naked virus. And there's lots of different ones. There's a lot of naked viruses out there and there are a lot of envelope viruses. So just kind of keep that in mind. All right. Here's a list of a number of different viruses out here. These are the different areas that they infect or where you might see them. And here's a number of different viruses. And you can go through the list and see which ones may be affected you. So most people have been infected with chickenpox. Maybe you're lucky and got vaccinated and never had to suffer from it. The other ones that typically people see is the common cold, and if you have a really bad cold, that could be actually flu. If it's the whole body, you will feel it. You'll know the difference between a cold and the flu because you really feel it. The other one that most people are aware of is the gastroenteritis and diarrhea. This is the norovirus that people tend to get. If you ever hear about the cruise ships where third, you know, 300 people go on the ship and then they come away with the diarrhea, that's typically what spreads. And so that's one that goes all over the place and people get infected with. But there's quite a few different varieties. And again, I just bring this up to just kind of tell you there's lots of viruses out there. But the one nice thing is we don't always get sick because our immune systems do a really good job of fighting these off. Okay. So the next question I pose to you, 
what do you think? Are viruses alive or not? So kind of think about that in your head. And I'm going to give you reasons why we don't think they are and why we do. And this is still a big argument in biology. So don't think that you're going to revolutionize and say, ah, I've got the right answer or no, you're wrong. Because you're going to be both right. If you think that they are alive, you're in one camp. And if you don't think they're alive, you're in another camp. And let's take a look and see. So the first reason why they don't think they're alive is because they really don't fit the definition of a cell. Now, I did say some viruses are an envelope and they have a membrane, but the viruses themselves don't make that membrane. They actually take it from the host cell that they infect. And so without that membrane and without those components like ribosomes and everything else, they really don't call them a cellular structure. And so by definition, they're not alive because they're not a cell. Okay. Another thing is they can't make their own ATP. They don't have the machinery to make ATP, and so they have no metabolism. They don't break anything down like glucose to make ATP. So that's another reason why we don't think they're alive. Again, there's no growth. And let me give you an example. If I put a plate of viruses in front of you, if you came back a week later, you'd have the same number of viruses in there. And so they don't grow. They don't get bigger. They don't get any smaller. They stay the same. And so that's one of the, another reason why they, you know, without that host cell to infect, they're really not alive. Okay, and then the last one is kind of also what I talked about. They can't reproduce, so that plate of bacteria or a plate of viruses doesn't change because they don't reproduce. And they only reproduce once they get inside your cells. And so that's the key factor is that they're not going to reproduce unless they get inside. Okay, now here's some, so I may have made up your mind now and said, okay, I agree with you, Dr. Jim, I don't think they're alive. But let me give you some arguments of why they think they are alive or why there's arguments for them to be alive. So the first one is, is that whoop, they're made of organic molecules, okay, because they're made of proteins and they have DNA or RNA. That would be a reason why they're alive. Every All organisms have organic molecules. Organism, you think of organic, organism. It's got to be alive, okay? Second thing is that they do have DNA as their genome, DNA or RNA. And again, that's really important. Maybe these are the first organisms out there that actually came about and then they evolved into bacteria. However, you know, they don't fit, fit that cellular definition in there, okay? And then the last thing, which is probably the most compelling, and a lot of people bring that argument up, is that they tend to have a purpose in life. You know, they're not out there just to float around and just to bind to things and, you know, maybe they get lucky. They're really out there to get you sick, okay? They're out there to fight for the same life that we're all fighting for. They just do it a little bit differently. What they do is they take the cell that you have and change it to make new viruses, and that's their life, okay? Whereas other, you know, other entities do the same thing where they either, you know, eat and consume and do these things, and so... A lot of people argue, well, they seem to have a quote-unquote life cycle. They can either reproduce or they can hide. And so that kind of is a compelling argument as well. So hopefully I've shown you both sides, and maybe it's kind of put some doubt in your mind. If you ask me what my definition was, if I go by the strict definition, I wouldn't consider them to be alive. And that's just my opinion in the sense that because they don't fit those what criteria of what something alive is. Now, again, you can make arguments in, in anything else, and you're not right or wrong for one way or the other. So I'm not going to ask you on the test to say, you know, you have to agree with me on this and you have to be right, because there is quite a bit of arguments. And we might see this change, you know, and someone might say no and have the definitive answer or why they think it is. And I, get, I think this will be a continuing debate of what's going on. Okay, so think of it again as a debate. You know, what you think, that's, you know, I, I completely agree and bring that up and we can talk about it in class. Okay, so let's see what else is out there. So, how do viruses actually get made or how do they get cultured? And so we need these viruses to make vaccines and that helps us to be protect, protected. And so what I just mentioned is that viruses can't grow or reproduce on their own. They are called obligate intracellular parasites. They need to get inside a cell in order to do the things in order to reproduce, okay? They cannot reproduce outside the living cell, and so this is really important. How do we actually get viruses to make for vaccines? Well, we can culture them inside living things. We either use chicken eggs, okay? And this is the typical way that we make vaccines, and so that's one of the questions why they ask you when you get the flu vaccine, are you allergic to eggs? because they make a lot of those flu particles or the flu vaccines inside of chicken eggs and then put that into the vaccine. So if you're allergic to chicken eggs, you are probably gonna be allergic to the vaccine itself. 
What they would do is then use one that's made in tissue culture, and again, they can make it using human cells to make the virus particles. The reason why it's not readily available to a lot of people is because it's a lot more expensive. Chicken eggs, easier to get, easier to take care of, and that's why they do it that way. So just wanted to show you out there how they actually do this. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is how do viruses re reproduce? So I just spent, you know, last five minutes telling you they can't reproduce unless they get into a cell. So now we have to talk about how viruses actually get in and then cause infection. And so what happens is, is the virus gets into the cell. Remember these spikes are the keys and if you, the cell has the right lock, it can work its way in. So here you see the flu virus binding to the cell. It releases its DNA into the cell and then what it does is it says, okay cell, time to stop making cell stuff, you make virus stuff. And so what it does is then makes new virus particles, they put those together, make new viruses, put it all together, and then they release it out and f infect new cells. And that's typically the what we call the lytic life cycle. And what lytic means is that means lysis to the cell. And I'm going to show you step by step what happens at each step, but I just want to bring this up and talk about how they actually reproduce. Okay. Now we use bacteriophages to describe these life cycles because they're a little bit easier to see than using animal cells. There's not a lot of difference between the animal viruses and the bacteriophages, but we just use it for the simplicity of the model. You can see it get in, get out, and, and do its business. And so we talk about two viral life cycles, and I put them in quotes because, again, that's that argument of being alive or not. But they a lot of times call them life cycles or virus cycles. And so you have two cycles, the vir or the lytic cycle, which is where you make new viruses all the time. You lyse the cell and you make new ones. Or you have the lysogenic, and the lysogenic is when the viruses go and hide. And so that one's really important when we're talking about things that get in and then you have reoccurring infections or things like this. So this is something like chicken pox where you might get it as a kid and then later in life it comes back as shingles and it gives you another infection. And so we'll talk about both of these here, things here in just a second. So this is the lytic cycle and you can see here it's the typical where the virus attaches to, in this case the bacteria, the virus attaches, it has the right key for the lock, it then releases its DNA into the cell the DNA then tells the cell, okay, stop making bacteria stuff, you're going to make new virus particles, and that's the biosynthesis. And then it puts it all together, that's called assembly and maturation. Okay, and then once it does that, it, uh, it does release. And typically, in the smaller organisms that viruses infect, they do what is cell lysis, and which happens is you get all these virus particles ready to leave the cell at once. It causes the cell to release like a big puff ball, and it releases all these viruses as one as one and so you see this release of viruses out into the environment that now they can go and infect. Other times we see these other things and I'll show you in a little bit where they actually bleb or butt off the cell and I'll show you that in a few minutes. Okay. The other thing that the virus can do is go into the lysogenic cycle and that's basically where the DNA goes in to hide and so it becomes integrated into the host DNA and what we and what it becomes what it we call latent so it basically goes to sleep because it doesn't make any new viruses at the time. And we see this a lot in human viruses where viruses get in, they might cause a small infection, and then they hide out for a long period of time. HIV, herpes, you name it, there's a lot of viruses that are out there that do this. It hides from the host, and this is really important, especially if the host has a wonderful immune system like we do that try and get rid of viruses. This is a way to hide from that immune system. Okay, and again, a lot of these viruses, once they go lysogenic, will reappear later in life and go into the lytic cycle. So it's a very fluid cycle where they can go in and out of the lytic and lysogenic cycle back and forth and do those things. Okay, the one problem with this, and again, we bring this up with certain viruses, is that it could lead to cancer. Now, you remember I was talking about mitosis and how we have those checkpoints and that stuff? Well, if you get the wrong virus particle integrated into the wrong genes and that stuff and it causes the cell cycle to be d destroyed then we get this replication and so we've seen this in certain viruses like HPV so you've probably heard of HPV furor which is a human papillomavirus and that gets in and can cause cervical cancer because it actually integrates its DNA into the host cell it changes or mutates that cell and leads to cancer development. And so that's why we worry about that, especially as a sexually transmitted disease, because you really don't see it until after the effects or these cancers start to develop. Okay? So what's the difference? So here's the lytic stage again, and that's basically where the virus goes in, makes new viruses, and then gets released. 
The lysogenic is where the DNA comes in and instead of telling the cell to make new viruses, it just incorporates itself into the genome itself. And so this is where the DNA gets put in and then it hides and it hides and it hides. And these things can replicate inside cells and so you can pass these on to future cells and everything else. And then some trigger out there triggers them and they go back into the lytic stage and then they make new virus particles and then release. And so that's the big thing as well. And so we see this, the lysogenic and lytic cycles and they go back and forth quite a bit. Okay, here's a nice little video that's given from your book and I'm going to show this here in our video just to kind of play it because I think this really does a good job explaining both cycles and shows you visually what happens. When phage lambda infects E. coli, either the lytic or the lysogenic cycle may be followed. In both cases, the first step involves the phage attaching to the host cell and injecting its DNA into the host cell. In the lytic cycle, phage nucleic acid is replicated and phage genes are expressed, resulting in production of phage proteins. Mature phage particles assemble and the host cell lysis, releasing the phage particles. And this is the same thing that happens in animal viruses as well. In the lysogenic cycle, the phage DNA is not replicated or transcribed. Instead, the phage DNA integrates into the host cell genome. The host cell can then replicate, carrying the integrated phage genome. The integrated DNA is referred to as prophage DNA, and the host cells carrying the prophage DNA are said to be in the lysogenic state. When the cells are exposed to ultraviolet light, or to certain chemicals, phage induction occurs. The prophage DNA is excised and the phage enters the lytic cycle. So I hope you were just paying attention to that where they made the comment that, again, exposure to certain chemicals or UV radiation can actually bring these viruses out. And we actually see this in humans as well. So one example is herpes. So a lot of times people will get sunburns or get too much sun on their face and that will actually trigger fever blisters or things like that. Or if you get sick with a cold, releasing chemicals and that stuff in your body or hormones and that will do it or lack of sleep. And a lot of things will cause these things to trigger and come out and, and then start infecting again. And so we know that there's a lot of these triggers out there that can go from and trigger a virus going from the lysogenic, which is the hiding stage, to the lytic cycle, which is making new viruses. So just be aware of that. All right. Now, animal viruses are very similar to the bacteriophage invasion. And again, I don't really talk too much about the differences. The entry is pretty much the same thing. It finds the right lock and key, allows for the, back, or the virus to get in. Then you release the RNA or DNA, and that's called uncoding once it gets in and releases that RNA and DNA. I think the biggest difference, though, is when it leaves the cell. A lot of times, these viruses that use or have a membrane will actually work their way up. And so you can kind of think of this like a drip, drippy faucet. Okay, and each drip, 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 each drip has a virus particle. And so what happens is the virus works its way, the virus capsid works its way to the membrane here, and then it works its way out of the cell and it takes a piece of the membrane with it. And you can see it really nicely here. I think this is a great picture where you can actually see the virus particles that are actually leaving the cell and it's taking a piece of the membrane with it. And I like to call that the slow death effect. And so with the, when you have a normal lytic and you just have the rupture of the cell, the cell is dead because you release all these things. In these types of viruses that actually take pieces of the membrane with it, it's kind of like you're slowly bleeding someone to death. It's kind of more of a torture thing. And so you can kind of think of it like this, where the virus just starts to slowly eat away at the cell and eventually the cell will die but it's kind of more of a slow type of death. So kind of think of it like that. Okay, here is a really good YouTube video. It's about five minutes long. I have it in my, um, in my YouTube page. Make sure to watch this. I think this shows you, kind of takes you through all the steps that I talked about, the infections, the locks and keys, and it shows how the flu virus actually infects us. And it's got some really cool animations and that stuff. So highly recommend watch this and it will probably make a lot of sense now that you've seen this uh, video. Okay, now the last thing I want to talk about is this infectious particle called prions. And prions are basically a protein. And it doesn't have any DNA or RNA associated with it. But what happens is these proteins can actually replicate over and over and over again. The bad thing about these proteins that replicate over and over again is that they can't be degraded. And so heat, 
chemicals, a lot of different things do not destroy these proteins. And so what happens is these things build up, build up, build up in the brains of these organisms that get infected with it. And so we've seen this in humans. It's called creutzfeldt jakob disease. And what it does is these proteins build up, build up, build up in your neural tissue and they cause holes to occur. And I call it like the Swiss cheese effect that you see in these things. And again, you can see a pretty uninfected brain versus a control brain. This also causes mad cow disease, so we've seen this. It's also known as scrapie in sheep, and also chronic wasting disease that we see in cattle, we see it in deer and elk populations in Wisconsin. So if you're a hunter, you want to stay away from these things because they're just sick animals and you don't want to deal with it. I mean, maybe shoot it to put it out of its misery, but don't eat it. And in, in the sense, the only way that you really can get infected with these things is by eating neural, infected neural tissue. So as long as you don't eat the brains and spinal cords of these animals, you should be okay. But I wouldn't risk it and just leave those animals alone. Now, the last one I like to talk about is this Kuru. And Kuru is actually a disease that's found in cannibals that are found in the South Pacific. And the reason why we call them cannibals is because one of their rituals was to actually eat their ancestors' brains after they died. And so it was kind of their ritual. And so these people would then develop these different diseases because these prion diseases actually because they would eat the brains of the infected individual. And so this would pass from one generation to the next to the next. And so you know, so I like this little sign, do you kuru? And if you, you know, smart cannibals don't eat brains. So again, tend to, you know, if you want to be safe, don't eat any neural tissue and you should be fine. And you won't get these spread to you. Okay. So let's summarize. Well, a virus is an infectious organic molecule. We talked about that. It has two parts. It has the protein shell on the outside called the capsid. And then it has the nucleic acid core, either RNA or DNA on the inside. And again, remember, they classify them, DNA viruses versus RNA viruses. Some, but not all, have an envelope on the outside. If they don't have an envelope, they're called naked. And if they do, they're envelope viruses. Okay. Are a virus alive or is a virus alive? Again, I showed you compelling arguments for both situations. And again, you can ask yourself that question. Maybe I'll ask you guys to see if you're watching the video. Do you think they are alive or not? So, you know, be ready for that question if I ask you that. Maybe I'll just ask you one time randomly. And then lastly, looking at the lytic and lysogenic. And so make sure you know these two life, quote unquote life cycles or viral cycles because we do ask about them and making sure that you know them and that the lytic cycle is where new viruses are made and infect and the lysogenic are when they go and hide. And again, the ramifications of that is that they can keep coming back over and over again if they hide like herpes or chicken pox, or they could potentially cause cancers where the DNA actually gets integrated into the cell genome and can cause mutations that lead to cancer development. And that's kind of a form like HPV. So we've come to the end of the lecture. Hopefully you learned something new about viruses. I think they're really important. I really like talking about viruses, if you couldn't tell, and that stuff. And so if you do have any questions, please feel free to email me. I'm glad you're watching these videos, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.